Man, uh, the part of the chapter that I'd like to focus on is in 1 Timothy 6, beginning there in verse number 20, where the Bible reads, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. And I want to focus on that phrase this morning, science falsely so called. The title of my sermon this morning is this, Science Fiction Religion. Science Fiction Religion. Because if you think about it, that which is not true, that which is a fable or a fairy tale, is fiction. And the science that we have today that's considered fact is actually in many ways science fiction. It's not actually real. It's only been invented in people's minds. Now, notice what the Bible says here. Right after it says science falsely so-called, in verse 21 it says, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. I like that word professing because professing is often used about a religion. He professes Christianity. He professes Islam. And I will submit to you this morning that a lot of what we call science today is actually more like a religion than it is science. And that's why the title of the sermon is Science Fiction Religion. Now, first of all, let me just give you a dictionary definition of religion. And then I'll give you a dictionary definition of science, okay? Religion is defined as a set of beliefs concerning the cause, nature, and purpose of the universe. Religion is defined as a specific, fundamental set of beliefs and practices generally agreed upon by a number of person or sects. Religion is defined as the body of persons adhering to a particular set of beliefs and practices. Now listen to the definition of science. A branch of knowledge or study dealing with a body of facts or truths systematically arranged and showing the operation of general laws. Science is defined as systematic knowledge of the physical or material world gained through observation and experimentation. And then the third definition, knowledge as of facts or principles gained by systematic study. So you see the word that keeps coming up over and over again in our definitions of science is knowledge. Things that we know, not things that we're guessing or hoping or thinking possibly could be true. No, it's knowledge. It's fact. It's law. That's what science means. In fact, when you think of the famous word omniscience that we use about God, what do we mean when we say that God is omniscient? We mean that he's what? All knowing, right? Because we say he's omnipotent, meaning all powerful, because omni means all. All potent, all powerful, omnipotent. And then we say, well, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent, all present. And then we also say he's omniscient. But when you look at the word omniscience, how do you spell omniscience? You spell it with omni and science. All knowledge, meaning that God is all knowing. He has omniscience. So science is what we know to be true. Not just this guessing, theorizing, hypothesizing. No, knowledge is a set of beliefs that through testing hypotheses, through experimentation, through observation, we've collected this body of knowledge, fact, laws that is known as science. Whereas religion, what's the word that kept coming in in the different definitions of religion? It's a belief. Okay, so it's a difference there between a religion, which is a belief, which is faith, and science, real science, which would be knowledge or fact that we can actually taste, see, touch, smell, hear. We can actually observe it with the five senses. Now, this belief system that today is known as science, the falsely so-called science that God predicted would come about, this science falsely so-called is not based on facts. It's not based on knowledge. It's actually a belief system. It's more like a religion. This is why a lot of people today will ask you this question. Well, do you believe in science? Who's ever been asked that question? Well, don't you believe in science? You believe in science? See, that's a pretty good question because it is something that you have to believe in. 
See, if it were just fact, if it were just knowledge, if it were something that could actually be proven through observation and experimentation, then you wouldn't have to believe in it. The reason you have to believe in it is because it's a religion. Because of the fact that it is not science, it is a belief system. And that belief system is based on two things I'm going to demonstrate this morning. Number one, that belief system is based upon hatred for God. And by that, I mean the God of the Bible. And number two, it's based upon science fiction. And I'm talking about Buck Rogers this morning. I'm talking about Star Trek. I'm talking about Star Wars. I'm talking about all the sci-fi that the Hollywood movies and the TV shows have made popular. That is really the basis for this belief system. And they say, oh, we're so rational. We're so logical. No, you're not. Oh, it's all based on fact. It's, it's all based on experiments. No, it isn't. It's based on two things. Number one, a deep-seated hatred for the God of the Bible. And number two, it's based upon watching too many science fiction movies and TV shows. Those are the bases. And I'm going to prove that to you this morning. Let's turn to Romans chapter one. That's always a good place to start any sermon. <laughs> Romans chapter one. That's where the Apostle Paul decided to start. <laughs> right? Romans chapter one. Great, great chapter. While you're turning there, I'll read for you the best verse in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, Amen. to the Jew first and also to the Greek. That's one of the greatest verses in the Bible because it tells you that salvation is for everyone that believeth. Notice he didn't say every, it's the power of God unto salvation for every church member, for everyone who's baptized. For everyone who lives a good life. No, it says to everyone who believeth. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. Another thing about that verse I want to point out is that Christianity is a belief. It is faith. It is a religion. Okay? So we will stand and boldly proclaim that without faith it is impossible to please him. Amen. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I'm not going to get up here today and present for you the proof for God in some scientific manner. No, this is the proof right here. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and faith is the evidence of things not seen. Amen. Here's all my evidence. But what I would submit to you is that the atheist also has faith. He's not any more scientific than I am. I mean, I'm basing it on faith in this book. Who has faith in this book this morning? Amen. Right. But here's the thing. The atheist today, he has faith in other books. He has faith in other men besides the man Christ Jesus. He has faith just like I have faith. His faith is in that which is vain and unprofitable. His faith comes from a deep-seated hatred for God and an overindulgence in science fiction. Now, Romans chapter 1, verse 19, the Bible says, Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. Now, manifest means that it's able to be seen. It's out there. He says, God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. You see, if they actually would perform observations and experimentation of the natural world that we live in, you know, it would just proclaim the glory of the creator who made all of it. Amen. That is the logical conclusion. But it says in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Jump down to verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Now, what I want to point out here is that these people who deny the God of the Bible... These people, the Bible says, don't want to retain God in their knowledge. Why don't they want to retain God in their knowledge? Well, that's explained in verse 29 and on, being filled with all unrighteousness. 
You, know, you don't want to retain God in your knowledge when you're filled with all unrighteousness because God is so holy, it's a constant reminder of your own unrighteousness. Yeah. But not only that, it says in verse 30 about these same people, backbiters, haters of God. Now, that's what I'm saying about this belief system. These people hate God. They don't want to retain God in their knowledge. So therefore, they set out to teach and preach the gospel of atheism. They go out to evangelize people that there is no God and they do it in the name of science, but it's science falsely so called. It's not real science. It's their belief. It's their faith. It's their system or ideology. Look what the Bible says back in verse 22. It says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Another reason why many of these fools call themselves a professor. Yeah, they profess themselves to be wise. The Bible says that they're fools. It says that they change the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man. Now, remember, in 1 Corinthians 11, the Bible teaches that man is the image and glory of God. Man is the image and glory of God. God created man in his own image. But they've changed, the Bible says, the glory of of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. One way to interpret this verse, which is a very legitimate interpretation, is that they're basically taking mankind, which is made in the image of God, which is the glory and image of God, and reducing him from an immortal soul, an eternal, never-dying soul, to a corruptible man who is like unto four-footed beasts and creeping things. What does this religion, this science fiction religion, teach about man? Do they teach that man glorifies God by his very existence because he's the glory and the image of the creator? No. They teach that he's a corruptible man, that he's going to die and be gone, and that he is in the image of beasts. They think that he is a glorified orangutan. They think that he's a glorified chimpanzee. They've changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Obviously, the, the, the main interpretation of this verse would be that they took God and made idols of him. They made images of him, uh, an image of a corruptible man, an image of a beast. But there, the Bible is so deep, there are multiple layers of meaning. And I believe that God is also prophesying what we see today in the form of this science, falsely so-called. Now, let me give you some of the elements of this sci-fi religion, this science fiction religion. It has the elements that you'd expect to find in a religion. What would you expect to find in a religion? Well, you'd expect to find preachers or apostles of that religion. You'd expect to find evangelists and teachers of that religion, wouldn't you? You'd also expect to find... Uh, certain rules governing morality, uh, certain ideas about right and wrong that come from that religion. You know, whether we were talking about Hinduism, Islam, whatever, these are the type of things you'd expect to find. Usually you'd expect to find a creation story in a religion, right? All the different religions of the world have a belief about how it all started, the creation story. And another element that you'd expect to find in a religion is an end times teaching, what, what's called eschatology, the study of final things. Uh, the religions of this world will point to some kind of a future apocalypse, whatever they see that as. Obviously, the Bible's no exception. We have the book of Revelation telling us how it all ends. So I'm going to go through these elements. Let's start with, first of all, the preachers of this sci-fi religion. Oh, this, this religion, this science fiction religion definitely has some preachers. Here are some of the big name preachers of this uh, science religion. Richard Dawkins, well, yeah. Stephen Hawking, Michio Kaku, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Christopher Hitchens, Bill Nye the science guy. You know, these are the apostles of this false religion. These are the false teachers and false prophets. Now, the Bible says, and if you would turn over to 1 Timothy 6, the Bible says in Psalm 62 verse 9, Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. So God is saying here that 
Men of low degree are nothing in God's sight. God doesn't respect any man's person. But that men of high degree are actually less than nothing in his sight. Lighter than vanity. Because they're a lie. What does it mean men of high degree are a lie? That they're a fraud. That they're not really as smart as they think they are. That they're not really as great as people are making them out to be. And of course, these preachers in this sci-fi religion, they love to glorify themselves through their degree. They've reached the degree of bachelor. I was glad to get out of the degree of bachelor, you know, when I got married. But, you know, oh, I reached the associate's degree, the bachelor's degree, the master's degree. You know, that comes back to He-Man, you know, masters of the universe. So uh, the master's degree, the doctorate, the Ph.D. And in their world, this is what exalts them amongst their peers. Well, he is a Ph.D., but God says that men of high degree are a lie. Yeah, right. They're lighter than vanity. Amen. They're worth less than the guy that's of low degree, the Bible says. <laughs> but God doesn't respect any man's person. So the first one of these apostles of... Uh, well, before I do that, let me just uh, show you something in 1 Timothy 6. This kind of jumped out at me while the scripture was being read. I, I love reading the Bible in church. Have you ever noticed that when the Bible's read in church, things jump out at you? that you don't always get when you're reading the Bible at home because we're gathered here together and God's spirit is in the midst of us. And when we read the Bible as a church, it seems like God really speaks to us. That's why we read the whole chapter before the sermon. That's actually a profitable time in the service to, to listen and learn. But one of the things that jumped out at me, because we're in this chapter that's talking about science falsely so-called and people erring from the faith. You know, I like this verse three. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud knowing nothing. Amen. See, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, yeah. the Bible says. So it would make sense that God's saying, well, if anybody is rejecting the words of Jesus Christ, he's proud and he's knowing nothing. So these people that think they're so smart, the Bible says the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. And that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But the first preacher of this sci-fi religion that I'd like to go over is Richard Dawkins. Now, this man is an evolutionary biologist. And he's the author of a book called The God Delusion. He's probably the most famous atheist, at least from what I've heard. It seems like I've heard of him more than anyone else as being the big, what I call an evangelical atheist. Okay. Somebody who's just not an atheist, but they want to just preach the gospel of atheism to the whole world. And what's funny about that is if I only had one life to live and I were an atheist and I thought I were just going to die and turn to dust, you know, I wouldn't spend my life trying to fight against an imaginary being yeah. called God. <laughs> that supposedly doesn't exist. I mean, we've got Don Quixote, Richard Dawkins here, fighting with windmills and shadow boxing against someone that he doesn't even believe exists. What's his point? Why doesn't he eat, drink, and be merry? Because tomorrow he dies. Right. What's the point, Richard Dawkins? But he's a zealous evangelical atheist. Now, let's see if his beliefs come from observation and experimentation, science, or whether they come from what I said they come from, a deep-seated hatred for God. Here's what Richard Dawkins says about God in his book. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. Jealous and proud of it. A petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Wow. Well, tell us how you really feel, <laughs> Richard Dawkins. You can tell here that he hates God. Yeah. He hates God all of, in all of fiction. And he's, he's read a lot of fiction. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the God of the Bible is worse than Darth Vader. And the God of the Bible is worse than the Emperor. You know, the God of the Bible is worse than all the villains of science fiction. But, you know, oh, he's such a bully. So, now, here's what's funny. Is that there was a debate between him and another guy. And the guy asked him, well, how do you know that the God of the Bible is not real? And he said, 
Well, the reason why is because the God of the Bible is this misogynistic, homophobic, yada, yada, yada. Does that make logical sense? No. To say that something doesn't exist because it's unpleasant? Yeah. Well, because God is the most unpleasant villain ever, that means he doesn't exist. Well, let me ask you something, Richard Dawkins. Do you think I'm pleasant? Because I exist. And I happen to be homophobic. I'm constantly labeled as misogynistic. I'm constantly labeled as being this horrible person by the world. But you know what? I exist. I'm here. Come, you know, as Jesus said, and, you know, handle me and see that I am flesh and bone. And a spirit has not flesh and bone as you see me to have. Yeah. I'm literally here. I mean, what kind of science is that to say, well, it doesn't exist because I don't like its personality. Oh, that's real logical. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense, buddy. Well, that's how we know. And then he's asked, well, you know, is it possible that intelligent design is there from some other being? And he said, well, it is possible that aliens could have created us. He said it is possible that those from another planet and another galaxy far, far away, you know, it's possible that long ago in a galaxy far, far away, someone, you know, planted life on earth and put life here, but not the God of the Bible. Does that sound scientific or does it sound pretty biased based on his deep-seated hatred for God? Now, there's another reason why these guys come up with this stuff that's not based on evidence, that's not based upon experimentation, but it's just based on their belief system. Go to 2 Peter chapter number 3, and we'll see why these preachers of the sci-fi religion, why is it that they don't believe in the God of the Bible? Why is it that they embrace this religion of science that's a, you know, so-called science? You know, people say, well, atheism's a religion, right? You've probably heard that. And, and I, I agree with that statement. I think that that's pretty clear by the definitions of religion. And often when they list the top religions in the world, they usually include atheism as, as being one of the top five religions in the world. But it's almost more accurate, I think, instead of saying atheism's a religion, is science is a religion. Because science is really these people's religion, not so much atheism. Because even these so-called big-name atheists they'll even sometimes throw out there the possibility that there could be a God, as long as it's not the God of the Bible. Just make that real clear, okay? But that there could be a God out there. But here's the thing, though. Science is their religion. That's really what it comes down. And again, when I say science, I'm using it very loosely, the way that they use it, the, the so-called science. That's why I don't say, hey, science is their religion. I say science fiction is their religion. It's a sci-fi religion this morning. But here's another scriptural reason why people reject the God of the Bible and go into this science religion. Look, if you would, at uh, verse number... Look, if you would, at verse number 3 of chapter 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, and here's where it all comes from, walking after their own lusts. That's where it all starts. He says, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last day scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they are... Now, look, when it says creation there, I've heard somebody say, well, these are Christians because they believe in creation. No. Christians are not the only ones who believe in creation. The, the atheists believe in creation. It's just a different creation. Their creation story is the Big Bang. We'll get to that a little later. But it says here, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. It's not that they went into the lab, did some experiments and said, well, you know, the conclusion I've drawn is that there's no God. No, no, they're willingly ignorant. What is it that makes them have a will to be ignorant about the creation? They have a will to be ignorant about the flood. It says they are willingly ignorant of that by the word of God, the heavens were of old. That God spake the world into existence. That God said, let there be light, and there was light. That in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It says, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. So the two things that they're ignorant of there are the creation and the flood, which account for the physical phenomenon that we see in this world. 
the creation and the flood. They're ignorant of those things. They make up their own version. But why are they willingly ignorant? The Bible says it is because they are walking after their own lusts. Mm -hmm. Now, more evidence of this is found in Psalm 14. You don't have to turn there. But in Psalm 14, 1, the Bible reads, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And often we stop quoting there. We don't quote the whole verse. You've heard that statement your whole life. Let's read the whole verse. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. That's the whole verse. So what's the verse actually saying here? He said that there's no God because he's corrupt and because he has done abominable works. So he doesn't want to believe that there's a God. The same thing is found in Psalm 53, verse 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. Corrupt are they and have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. That's the reason. According to 2 Peter 3, according to Psalm 14, according to Psalm 53. Listen to this. You say, well, what makes you think that Richard Dawkins has done abominable iniquity? Well, first of all, we already know that he hates God. I don't think anybody would doubt that. I don't think anyone would argue with that. Listen to this story. This is from the Huffington Post. Now, who here thinks that the Huffington Post is a radical conservative <laughs> news outlet? No, this is a, God, a godless, God-hating outlet. And even they're calling out Richard Dawkins' wickedness. Okay? This is from the Huffington Post just a few years ago. Richard Dawkins' pedophilia remarks provoke outrage. That's the headline. Canterbury, England. Richard Dawkins, and I'm just going to read the article verbatim from Huffington Post, except I'm going to have to censor some of it for the sake of little ears. Richard Dawkins, one of the world's best known and outspoken atheists, has provoked outrage among child protection agencies and experts after suggesting that recent child abuse scandals have been overblown. In an interview in the Times Magazine on Saturday, September 7th, Dawkins, age 72, said that he was unable to condemn what he called mild pedophilia that he experienced at an English school when he was a child in the 1950s. So where are this guy's beliefs coming from? He's molested as a kid, and he says, well, I can't condemn it. I can't condemn the fact that my teacher that was a dude molested me. No big deal. It's just mild pedophilia. Yeah. What a bunch of filth. Yeah. Yeah. This is the most renowned atheist out there. This is the kind of stuff he's saying. Even the, the, um, even the Huffington Post article itself starts out, Richard Dawkins, one of the world's best known and outspoken atheists. Those are the first words of the article if not the most well-known and outspoken. Referring to his early days at a boarding school in Salisbury, he recalled how one of the teachers, and he, and he explains what the guy did to him, and it's not mild at all. And I'm not even going to read it because of the fact that I don't want to pervert your mind. But the stuff that he did was not mild. Anybody who thinks it's mild is a filthy pervert themselves. Yes, that's you, Richard Dawkins. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. He said other children in his school peer group had been molested by the same teacher. But he concluded, I don't think he did any of us lasting harm. Wow. Wow. Well, you know, I've noticed something about you that you hate God. I wonder if that has to do with the fact that you were molested. Oh, no, it didn't harm me at all. No, it turned you into a God-hating atheist. Yeah. Now, you'll often find that people, when they get molested, they, they lash out against God and hate God and become a hater of God, unfortunately. Now, not everyone, of course, you know, that there's redemption there. And a lot of people who've been molested were able to, you know, get over that and live normal lives and live godly lives. But unfortunately, there's a tendency for those who get molested to be bitter against God. And they shouldn't, but that's just a phenomenon. And he says... In this quote, I'm very conscious that you can't condemn people of an earlier era by the standards of ours. Just as we don't look back at the 18th and 19th centuries and condemn people for racism in the same way as we would condemn a modern person for racism, I look back a few decades to my childhood and see things like caning, like mild pedophilia, and I can't find it in me to condemn it by the same standards as I would or anyone would today, he said. He said the most notorious cases of pedophilia involve rape and even murder and shouldn't be bracketed in with what he called just a mild, you know, whatever. 
You know, don't, I mean, unless they kill you. I mean, unless they just violently abuse you. I mean, come on, it's just a little mild pedophilia. I mean, look, anyone who says that, I believe is a pedophile themselves. Because no normal person would justify pedophilia like that. Ah, That's no big deal. I submit to you that Richard Dawkins is presumably a pedophile if he's going to say that it's fine. Why else would he be saying it's fine? Now, let's see what Richard Dawkins considers child abuse. Here's a quote from his book, The God Delusion. Faith can be very dangerous. And deliberately to implant it into a vulnerable mind. uh, Let me start. I'm sorry. Faith can be very dangerous. And deliberately to implant it into the vulnerable mild. Blah. I can't even read this junk. (laughs) Into the vulnerable mind of an innocent child is a grievous wrong. So he says that putting faith into the mind of an innocent child, that is a grievous wrong. But just molesting and and raping it mildly, I can't condemn it. But don't you dare teach him the Bible. And you're going to tell me that this man is so smart and oh, he's so intelligent. And oh, 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 how dare you, Pastor Anderson, speak against Richard Dawkins when he has more intelligence in his little finger than you have in your whole body. And you're just an uneducated bumpkin because my apostle of my sci-fi religion is so much smarter than you. No, he thinks pedophilia is fine and that teaching the Bible is child abuse. You can't even make this stuff up. I mean, the truth is stranger than fiction. This stuff's bizarre, isn't it? Dawkins, an evolutionary biologist, has been married three times and has one daughter. Now, this guy doesn't seem to be an expert in biology. He's mating with at least three women and producing one child. This guy's not an expert, apparently. But it's just kind of funny that this guy is getting his butt kicked, evolutionarily speaking. You know, I mean, if we're talking survival of the fittest, if we're talking about, you know, selective uh, reproduction, I mean, I've got my ninth on the way, Richard Dawkins. And I've been married to only one woman. You've been married to three different women. But this guy, it seems like he's really living to the full. He says, you got to live your life to the fullest. Don't let Christianity hold you back. I submit to you that my quality of life, being married to the same person for over 15 years now and having eight children is higher than the quality of life of a guy who's married three different women. That's a lower quality of life, my friend. And I'm not down on you. Obviously, there are great men in the Bible who only have one child. I'm not criticizing people who only have one child. But what I am saying is that this guy's all about reproduction. That's his whole study evolutionary biology and this guy marries three different women and produces one child okay and and this guy is supposedly living his best life now well if you're so smart why can't you stay married to the same person why do you keep failing at marriage and you say well you know he just wanted to then why did he get married when you get married you're claiming that it's for life right so he claimed it's for life gets married and then fails gets married again claims it's for life fails gets married a third time to a woman you know that that he's still with apparently so i'm not really impressed with uh with his life now although he's only fathered one daughter albeit he's he's uh you know had three different life's mates he did father the meme now listen I want to give honor where honor's due here because people always tell us about how these scientists have given us so much and, and we enjoy the cars and the airplanes and we enjoy the, the smartphone and then we have the goal to deny their science religion. Well, let me point out to you that these apostles of sci-fi religion, they didn't give us the technology that we have. If you actually look at the achievements, the scientific achievements of Richard Dawkins... Michio Kaku, Stephen Hawking, you'll find that they are nil. But look, I have to give Richard Dawkins credit for one major achievement. You know, I'm, I'm going to be balanced up here. Because this guy did contribute something. Okay, you know how when you're on Facebook, there are these things called memes. Who knows what I'm talking about? Listen to me. Don't tell me that evolutionary biologists don't invent anything. Don't tell me that we do not benefit 
as humanity from these scientists such as quantum physicists, theoretical astrophysicists, and evolutionary biologists. Oh no, these guys are bringing something to the table. Did you know that Richard Dawkins came up with that word meme? The word that we've all wondered how to pronounce our whole lives? Is it ma'am? Is it meme? Is it may may me me? You know, nobody knows how to pronounce it. it you know, couldn't you have come up with something where people would just know how to pronounce it, Richard Dawkins? But no, he came up with that term meme. So he, ha he is uh, uh, someone who's contributed to the, our quality of life. Listen to this. This is from Wikipedia. Fathering the meme is what this section on Wikipedia is called. So this guy is surviving. He is propagating his gene pool more than just through that one daughter because he fathered the meme. Dawkins coined the word meme, the behavioral equivalent of a gene, as a way to encourage readers to think about how Darwinian principles might be extended beyond the realm of genes. Get it? Meme gene? Because memes are not always copied perfectly. Don't you hate that? They might become refined, combined, or otherwise modified with other ideas. This results in new memes, which may themselves prove more or less efficient replicators than their predecessors. I'm sorry, I got to get out the Dr. Spurgle glasses. Thus providing a framework for a hypothesis of cultural evolution based on memes. A notion that is an analogous to the theory of biological evolution based on genes. <laughs> so basically what he's saying is, you know, yeah, evolution. Haven't you seen how memes evolve? <laughs> Hello, memes evolve. Well, guess what? So does everything else. <laughs> and if we could just get people to see how memes evolve, maybe they'll understand that everything else evolved. Now, although Dawkins invented the term meme, he's not claimed that the idea was entirely novel. There have been other expressions for similar ideas in the past. Now, the popularization of these things led to the emergence of a new field called memetics. I mean, you've heard of genetics? Well, now there's a new field called memetics. A field from which Dawkins has distanced himself. <laughs> Hey, so memetics is the bastard son of Richard Dawkins. He gave birth to a whole branch of science and he won't even claim it as his own. Come on, own it, Richard Dawkins. Be proud of it. A whole branch of science. You came up with it. He's like, whoa, no, I don't, I don't want anything to do with, you know, all those, me all those memes on Facebook. I don't want to be associated. You know, those memes are evolving, my friend. Case closed. James Gleick describes Dawkins' concept of the meme as his most famous and memorable invention and that it is far more influential than his selfish genes or his later proselytizing against religiosity. Oh, you think you're going to go down in history, Richard Dawkins, for being against religion? Nope, it's the meme. It's memetics. You coined it, buddy. Own it. I got to hurry. I'm running out of time. Let's talk about the creation myth of this sci-fi religion. So number one, we talked about the preachers. There are these preachers. We talked about one, Richard Dawkins. We're going to get into some more. But let's talk about their creation myth. What does the Bible teach about creation? Go to Genesis chapter 1, if you would. Genesis chapter 1. Of course, it starts with that famous verse, In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I'm going to also read for you Exodus 20, verse 11, where the Bible reads, For in six days... The Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So we see there that in six days, God made the heaven and the earth. That's Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. So there's no gap between Genesis 1, verse 1 and verse 2. Now, you didn't really need me to tell you that because honestly, if you just opened the Bible and started reading it, there's no way you would just assume a gap there. That idea is a new idea that goes back to the 19th century because of the fact that with evolution and the Big Bang and all these different things coming about in people's minds, 
they tried to adapt the Bible to try to fit with the new science religion and to go together with it. I don't believe it's compatible. I mean, the Bible here is just clearly stating, if you just take it for what it says, that the earth is created in six days and that God rested on the seventh day. Also, in this chapter, we find that everything brings forth after its own kind. Look at verse number 11. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. For sake of time, we'll just jump down to verse 24. God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Something that comes up with the plants and with the animals is that they reproduce after their own kind. This is not evolution. Now, when it says kind, it doesn't mean necessarily the exact species or the exact variation. So, for example, the kind of animal doesn't change, but you can have a wide variety within that kind. For example, you have a dog. That's a kind of animal, a dog, right? But you have all kinds of different dogs, and they all look different. They all share a common ancestor. You know, it's not like God just told Noah to put every breed that the American Kennel Club has listed <laughs> on the ark. Obviously, he's just got two dogs, a male and a female. And people say, huh, you think that all the dog breeds we see today came from two dogs? They think that all the animals we see today came from two animals. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. So they think it's crazy that we think a poodle is related to a Rottweiler or whatever, you know, or a Chihuahua is related to uh, a Great Dane, but they don't think it's weird to think that an elephant's related to a turtle. <laughs> right? So, yeah, obviously Noah, and that's when they try to make these calculations like, oh, there's no way he could fit the animals on the ark. Because they try to put like every little variation of animal on the ark, every species, instead of every kind. You say, well, what separates a kind? Well, if they can breed with each other, it's the same kind. Okay? So, obviously, you can breed different kinds of dogs, and, and, and they can breed together and so forth. So, everything brings forth after its own kind. Okay, what's the creation myth of the sci-fi religion? Well, now we're going to get into another one of the prophets of the sci-fi religion named Stephen Hawking. And Stephen Hawking is this crippled guy that basically, he can't even move, he can't talk. He's, I don't, I'm not sure what's wrong with him, but he has some kind of a disease. And of course, there are many great people and, and godly people who are afflicted with disease. And, uh, but here's the thing, it's just so sad to see a guy who is in this condition, can barely even move. But yet, it's like he's just using every bit and ounce of strength that he has just to hate the God of the Bible and to deny the truth of God's word, which just really makes him a disgusting creature. The fact that he hates God with every last ounce of his being and that he's just ready to just plunge into the depths of hell, when in reality, if he accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, he could have a brand new body. He could be leaping in for joy in heaven. Instead, he chooses to go straight into hell and to be in that condition for all eternity. Now, here's what Stephen Hawking says about the creation. Now, on one side we, side, we have God's word, which says what? In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Here's what he says in his book from 2010, The Grand Design. Because there is a law such as gravity... The universe can and will create itself from nothing. Let me read that again. Because there is, a, and I'll read a little further this time. Because there is a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Spontaneous creation is the reason that there's something rather than nothing. Why the universe exists, why we exist. It's not necessary to invoke God to light the blue touch paper and set the universe going. So you may ask yourself the question, you know, well, how can the universe create itself? Because gravity. Oh. Hello, idiot. How dare you? Wait, wait a minute. Do you even have a degree? Do you have a degree in science? And I'm not talking about memetics, okay? I'm talking about real science. I mean, do you have a degree in evolutionary biology? Do you have a degree in astrophysics? 
Do you have a degree in any kind of science? Huh? Because you can't even hold a candle to these great men who preach this sci-fi religion. And listen to me. I don't care if you understand or not. The universe can and will create itself from nothing because gravity. Because gravity. Case closed. And if you don't get it, well, you're just too dumb to get it. And I, I don't know what to tell you. Because there's a law such as gravity, the universe can and will create itself from nothing. Doesn't this really bring new meaning to the verse, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools? Yeah. <laughs> now, how can you dare insult the intelligence of Stephen Hawking? Now, if some guy told you that in the street, you'd say, go home, you're drunk. <laughs> but because it's Stephen Hawking, you know, we take it real seriously, and it's repeated in the news. This, this quote was all over the news as being profound. It's amazing. I mean, have you read Stephen Hawking's new book? It's fascinating. I mean, it's like a bestseller book. Well, let's go through the life of Stephen Hawking. Let's look at his achievements because I think once you see all of his great achievements, all of his great knowledge, all the inventions that he's given us, I think you'll understand why we should, you know, stop and take that quote a little more seriously. <laughs> Beginning in 1973, Hawking moved into the study of quantum gravity and quantum mechanics. But you probably don't even know what that means, do you? <laughs> His work in this area was spurred by a visit to Moscow. Have you ever even been there? And discussions with Yaakov Borisovich Zeldovich and Alexei Starobinsky, whose work showed that according to the uncertainty principle, rotating black holes emit particles. <laughs> to Hawking's annoyance, his much-checked calculations produced findings that contradicted his second law, which claimed that black holes could never get smaller and supported Bekenstein's reasoning about their entropy. Now, here's the thing about this. Don't you hate it when you have a law and then you do all these calculations and everything proves that your law is false? You know, it's like you keep using that word law. It's like you don't know what it means, though. <laughs> law? I thought a law is something that we know for sure. No, but Stephen Hawking's got these laws that keep getting disproven by facts. <laughs> by a bunch of Russian guys that are, that are you know, hanging him out to dry. <laughs> you know quantum, physically speaking. In the late 1970s, Hawking was elected the Lucasian Professor of Mathematics at the University of Cambridge. His inaugural lecture as Lucasian Professor of Mathematics was titled, Is the End in Sight for Theoretical Physics? Boy, I sure hope so. And he proposed that N equals 8 supergravity as the leading theory to solve many of the outstanding problems physicists were studying. Hawking's promotion coincided with a health crisis, which led to Hawking accepting, albeit reluctantly, some nursing services at home. At the same time, he was also making a transition in his approach to physics, becoming more intuitive and speculative rather than insisting on mathematical proofs. <laughs> Okay, so these guys are all about proof. It's all about the evidence, right? No, it's more just like intuitive, man. Dude, dude, just smoke this. You're going to understand black holes, man, I'm telling you. It's going to take you, dude, this is going to take you into a whole new dimension, man. I mean, you're not going to need to rely so much on, like, these mathematical proofs. You know, I mean, that stuff's just holding you back, man. You got to get more intuitive. You got to get more speculative, man. Just take this drug, man. It's going to open your mind to a whole new galaxy, man. <laughs> you know, it's more speculative rather than insisting on mathematical proofs. Who needs them? Who needs proof? Hey, this is what he said. I'd rather be right than rigorous. I'm not going to be rigorous in my testing and make sure that, you know, this stuff's actually right. I'd rather just say, I'm right. 
because it really annoyed me when that guy proved me wrong in Russia. <laughs> In 1981, he proposed that information in a black hole is irretrievably lost when a black hole evaporates. This, you know, this stuff has really improved my quality of life. Yeah. I know that this stuff really went into the development of my particular smartphone. <laughs> <laughs> the information paradox violates the fundamental tenet of quantum mechanics and led to years of debate, including the black hole war. Dun, 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 dun. with Leonard Seusskind and Gerard Tehoft. By 2003, consensus among physicists was growing that Hawking was wrong about the loss of information in a black hole. In a 2004 lecture in Dublin, he conceded his 1997 bet. Doesn't this sound real scientific? Well, I'll bet you that information is lost in a black hole. Huh? I got a hundred bucks that says that it's lost. But then 2004 rolled around. It was time for Hawking to ante up. Time for him to pay up. Because he conceded, you know, his bet against Presco. But he described his own somewhat controversial solution to the information paradox problem involving the possibility that black holes have more than one topology. So I, you know, I know I've been proven wrong, but maybe, maybe it's both. As part of another long-standing scientific dispute, Hawking had emphatically argued and bet... This guy puts his money where his mouth is. <laughs> He had emphatically argued and bet that the Higgs boson would never be found. The particle was proposed to exist as part of the Higgs field theory by Peter Higgs in 1964. Hawking and Higgs engaged in a heated and public debate. Remember when you pay-per-viewed that? It was sort of like when people pay-per-viewed like Tyson versus, what was the guy? Holyfield. Yeah, it was like when you pay-per-viewed like Tyson versus Holyfield. Remember that, remember that debate, Hawking and Higgs? It was a very heated and public debate over the matter in 2002, and again in 2008, with Higgs criticizing Hawking's work and complaining that Hawking's celebrity status gives him instant credibility that others don't have. The particle was discovered in July 2012. Oops. I mean, this guy's got a gambling problem, and he's going, <laughs> he's going for, he's throwing good money after bad. Hawking quickly conceded that he'd lost his bet and said that Higgs should win the Nobel Prize for Physics, which he did in 2013. By the way, Haw Hawking and Higgs are dumb and dumber, just so you know. But anyway, <laughs> Hawking has stated that given the vastness of the universe, aliens likely exist, but that contact with them should be avoided. Now, here's the thing about that, is that there's no evidence for aliens. None. Zero. Zilch. Nada. But yet, when you listen to these atheist scientists, they all talk about aliens. Why? Because it's based on two things. Deep-seated hatred for the God of the Bible, but don't forget element number two, science fiction is a major source. We're going to get into that. <laughs> Hawking has argued that com computer viruses should be considered a new form of life. <laughs> I mean, is this guy smart or what? We're not worthy. Stephen Hawking, I repent in sackcloth and ashes. I know that thou canst do everything. Stephen Hawking. Hawking has argued that computer viruses should be considered a new form of life. And has stated that maybe it says something about human nature that the only form of life we've created so far is purely destructive. Talk about creating life in our own image. You haven't created life, Stephen Hawking, and you never will. Amen. Only God can create life. In an interview published in The Guardian, Hawking regarded the concept of heaven as a myth, believing that there is no heaven or afterlife, and that such a notion, and that such a notion was a fairy story for people who are afraid of the dark. That's who believes in heaven and eternal life fairy tale for people who believe in the dark. You're the one who spends your whole life talking about black holes. <laughs> Sounds like you're afraid of the dark. Yeah. 
I gotta hurry. I'm, I'm already out of time, but I'm gonna keep on going because I can. All right. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 22, verse 13. Let's talk about the, the morality of this sci-fi religion. Okay, we talked about the creation story of the sci-fi religion, which is that the universe can and will create itself from nothing because gravity. Okay, duh. Okay, then we talked about the preachers of this religion. We listed off several of them. We, we paid particular attention to... Um, uh, Richard Hawking and Richard, or I'm sorry, Stephen Hawking and Richard Dawkins. It's easy to mix those up sometimes. And they're both highly esteemed. We don't want to dishonor them by mixing up their names. But thirdly, let's talk about the morality of this sci-fi religion. Well, there are a couple different denominations of the sci-fi religion. You know, this is a whole nother sermon. It needs to... Come back tonight for that, okay? <laughs> because, you know, it's a whole sermon of itself. All right, the morality of the sci-fi religion coming soon to a, a pulpit near you. Let's jump to the fourth point, the eschatology of the sci-fi religion, okay? The eschatology or end times beliefs of this sci-fi religion. Now, when we think of our eschatology, it has to do with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And again, eschatology is just a fancy schmancy word for the study of end times or the study of last things, okay? Well, our eschatology focuses upon what? The second coming of Jesus Christ. The book of Revelation that gives end times prophecy, it starts out talking about the second coming of Christ. It says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. And then it ends with, Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth the sayings of this book. So it starts out and ends with, that's the theme, right? The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there's an eschatology of the sci-fi religion that has to do with the coming of aliens. So we look to the coming of Christ. They look for the coming of aliens. I mean, you talk about these guys, they say, well, you know, inevitably, eventually, we're going to come into contact with aliens. Kind of like we're waiting for Jesus to come back. They're waiting for aliens. <laughs> They're waiting for the UFOs to show up. Okay. A lot of them are kind of scared of these UFOs, too, and saying it's not going to be, it's going to be like when Columbus came to the Indians. It didn't go so well for the Indians. That's how it's going to be when the aliens come to us. Okay. But part of their eschatology in this sci-fi religion is that they desire a one-world government and a one-world religion. Now, I'm just going to briefly touch upon one of the apostles of the sci-fi religion named Michio Kaku. This guy, Michio Kaku, is a very famous astrophysicist, theoretical physicist. And this guy is real into science fiction, okay? And he, but, so he, he's kind of an expert that they'll turn to if they want to really talk about lightsabers, really talk about the, the force fields or, you know, around the Starship Enterprise. He's kind of a go-to guy to really get the answers that we want. You know what I mean? So this guy's an expert on physics, and he says that if you're not for one world government, if you're against one world government, you're a terrorist. Anyone who doesn't want one world government, he basically says, you're a terrorist because you have to understand that it's our destiny. Because he says this, he said, there are three types of civilizations. And I'll close on this point. And if you would go to Psalm 2, that's the, the scripture we're going to close on, Psalm 2. But he says, there are three types of civilizations. He says, when we scientists go out looking for aliens, when we go out, he doesn't call them aliens, you know, intelligent life in the universe, call it right. When we go out looking for intelligent life in the universe, we're not looking for little green men. We're looking for type one, type two, and type three civilizations. Because it'd be ridiculous to look for little green men, right? Because we all know they're going to be a different color than that. <laughs> and why would they be green? Hello. He says, we're not looking for little green men. Oh, no. We're looking for type one, type two, and type three civilizations. He says, let me tell you what a type one civilization is. It's one who has mastered their planet. They have total control of their planet. They're harnessing the power of their planet. You know, that which is in the core, that nuclear reactor that's in our core. 
and all that. He, they've harnessed it. And then they've harnessed the power of their sun. And they've mastered control of their planet. They're in dominion of their planet. Type 2. And he said, an example of this would be Buck Rogers. Buck Rogers is the best example I could give you of this. And then he said, there's a type 2 civilization where they have mastered their own galaxy. And this would be the Galactic Federation of Star Trek. Then you have a type 3 civilization where they've mastered multiple galaxies. And this is what we know as the Galactic Empire of Star Wars. That's the pinnacle. Right there. Now this created great controversy amongst physicists because some of them think Star Trek is way better than Star Wars. Like, you know, just to name a notable name, Neil deGrasse Tyson, for example, you know, very well-known atheist scientist, you know, he thinks this theory is wrong because of the fact that Star Trek is better and that the Star Trek Enterprise would just demolish the Millennium Falcon in a one-on-one -on -one fight. <laughs> and if you don't realize that, you're an idiot, okay? But he said, no, type three is the Star Wars, uh, the Star Wars society, okay? And he says, you know what we are? You know what we are on that scale? What do you think we are? You think we're type one? You think we're type two? You think we're type three? You know what we are? We're zero. We're a type zero civilization. We're not even any of these. We just are so lame that we're a zero. But here's the problem. No one's ever discovered a type one civilization. There's no such thing as a type one, type two, or type three. Even he'll admit there's no evidence that there's any aliens even out there. But yet he has this whole grading scale. So it'd be sort of like this. It'd be sort of like if I said, you know, basketball players can be put in three categories. Type one, type two, and type three. A type one basketball player can dunk the ball on a 15-foot rim. A type two basketball player can dunk the ball on a 20-foot rim. A type three basketball player can dunk the ball on a 25-foot rim. You know what Michael Jordan is? Type zero. You know what Shaquille O'Neal is? Kareem Abdul-Jabbar? You know what these guys are? They're type zero. Now, wouldn't that be ridiculous and stupid since there's no one who could do those things? It doesn't exist. But this is the thing that you can expect to hear from someone like Michio Kaka and his, you know, his, his inflated ego of his, you know, overstated intelligence that, you know, we're looking for type one, top two, and top three civilizations. Come on, haven't you seen Buck Rogers? Haven't you seen Star Trek? Haven't you seen Star Wars? And he said, the only way we're going to make it from a type zero to a type one is a one world government. That's the only way. We must unite in a one world system. And the people who don't want to unite are terrorists. That's what he said. It's, look it up. Look at Psalm 2, verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. And that's what we see now. The rulers uniting together, the United Nations, and they take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed or, or his Christ, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. You say, why do you laugh at these guys this morning? Why do you mock them? Why do you mock a guy in a wheelchair? I mean, come on, you wouldn't mock a guy in glasses, would you? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. The reason I mock, the, the Lord's going to mock. Amen. He said, I'll mock when your fear cometh. The Lord shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. We know it's the Antichrist who wants a one world government. Yeah. That wants a new world order. This sci-fi religion is in direct opposition with God's plan for this world. They want that which the devil wants. Yeah. That's what it all comes down to. These apostles of sci-fi religion, I'll tell you why they're being propped up by the media. Because the media is run by people who want a one world system. Yeah. A conspiracy to create a new world order yeah. is what is behind propping up these really smart guys that aren't really quite as smart as we thought, are they? It's about a new world order. It's about the devil.
Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the clear teaching of your word, Lord. And I thank you so much for the Baptist preachers that I grew up listening to and the Baptist preachers that I would look at today and, and look up to and, and, and uh, listen to their words and that I don't have to listen to these kind of foolish apostles of sci-fi. Lord, thank you that we have the word of God, which is never changing, always true, and beats any science textbook any day of the week. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.